Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Walter tipped me off to a story that's something we've all thought about, I think, at one time or another. And it happened in Ohio. The New York Daily News, uh, dot com ran the story, but it's been widely reported. Uh, Brian Nemitz wrote it. Driver paralyzed after plowing into an Ohio man's fortified mailbox sues homeowner. So many people know that if you own a piece of property, the mailbox out by the road, occasionally mailboxes get hit by cars. Now, sometimes mailboxes get vandalized. And of course, there's some areas where it's famous that teenagers goofing around will occasionally harm mailboxes. And uh, damaging a U.S. Postal Service mailbox is actually a federal offense, which we'll talk about in a second. But some people who get fed up with this will take, instead of having a mailbox on a little wooden post, put something a little more robust out there to protect their mailbox. And in fact, at one point in time, I had a house where the previous owner, and this was in keeping with how the things were in that neighborhood, had built this brick structure and then put the mailbox in the middle of it. And it always bothered me having this big thing at the end of my driveway. I was scared of it. (laughs) So I actually, at one point in time, called up my brother said, guys, bring over sledgehammers. We're removing my mailbox. And we dismantled the mailbox and put in one that was on a post. And I'd never had trouble with it, but I just didn't like having this 9,000-pound structure at the end of my driveway uh, with, you know, a mailbox in it. It was just, it was an eyesore. But, but here's what's going on. Right now, the Ohio Supreme Court is considering a case where a car crashed into a mailbox and it left a motorist paralyzed. And the mailbox was heavily fortified, sitting on top of an eight-inch hollow metal pole planted three feet into the ground and reinforced in concrete. Now, this was on someone's private property. They did this to fortify their mailbox, and then somebody hit it and got injured as a result. Now, they recently had oral arguments in front of the Ohio Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has not ruled yet, so we don't know yet what's going to happen on this. But a gentleman was driving to work in December of 2016 when he ran across a patch of black ice in his truck, and he slid into that mailbox, which was in a gentleman's front yard in Bellevue, Ohio. Now, the mailbox was 21 inches from the road, so less than two feet from the road. The man's vehicle rolled over after hitting the mailbox, and it wound up partially on that man's property, where the mailbox remained in place. So the truck hit the mailbox, and the truck bounced off, and the mailbox just stayed there. The collision fractured that man's neck in several places, and he's now a quadriplegic. So the man who owned the mailbox said that he did that after the box had been knocked from its perch on multiple occasions, including cases that he believed were intentional. So he thought people were messing with his mailbox, He was getting sick and tired of it, so he decided to make it so his mailbox would withstand a little more uh, abuse. Before doing so, he checked the post office standards for mailboxes, and they suggested a pole that's two inches in diameter and two feet into the ground. But instead, he went with one that was eight inches in diameter, three feet into the ground. So the question is, are the recommendations from the post office something that you're bound by, Or are they merely guidance, suggestions, uh, best practices? We don't know. So he went ahead and went with the bigger dimensions because he didn't believe that the two-inch diameter, two-foot pole, you know, two feet into the ground, would do it for him. Now, a local official actually expressed concern about the mailbox and its placement and suggested it might damage a snowplow if a snowplow hit it. Now, (laughs) I've known people who've driven snowplows. I've also known people who've had mailboxes taken up by snowplows. And if somebody actually told you, hey, dude, I think your mailbox might damage a snowplow, you may have overbuilt it a bit. But, but, again, I wasn't there. So an attorney for the driver believes that the homeowner knew from history that his mailbox was in a location where it could be struck by vehicles by accident. And he had disregarded the post office's standards for installing such a structure. So if it's going to get hit by accident, you do have to think about that because accidents do happen. The Ohio State Supreme Court summarizes the issue at hand as a matter of the homeowner not being responsible for the man's driving, 
but possibly at fault for creating a dangerous situation. So apparently on the record, a judge said, a landowner may generally owe no duty of care to errant motorists who strike an off-the-road hazard, but is there an exception when a landowner consciously creates a hazardous condition in a right-of-way with the actual knowledge of the danger it presents to motorists who unintentionally veer off the traveled portion of the road? So judges will often ask questions like this during oral arguments. And so there's two attorneys, one for each side. Might be more, you never know. And Ashley says, here's, here's the question. You, what do you think? You, what do you think? Okay, explain the basis, the rationale, the only case law says that. What about you? Is there case law in other states? Is there case law in our state? Is there a public policy issue here? So an investigation by the Highway Patrol found that the vehicle would not have flipped if it had hit a normal mailbox. So they're going to say that but for that mailbox being fortified like that, this man's vehicle would not have flipped. He would not have broken his neck. He wouldn't be a paraplegic. At least that's what they think. Um, the homeowner argues it's unfortunate that the driver hit the one square foot at the edge of his property that presented an obstacle, but that he's not responsible for vehicles driven onto his property or the black ice on the roadway. An attorney for the driver told the Daily News by email that he expects the Ohio Supreme Court to reach a decision in four months, maybe. And the attorney for the homeowner has not responded to a comment or a request for a comment. So, you know, obviously there's a line there somewhere because I've got my property. There's a road that goes by it. And this is my property. There's the road. Cars should stay on the road, but occasionally they don't. And is it understandable that occasionally they don't? So if a car slides off the road onto my property, what happens? You know, presumably they've got insurance. Presumably I've got insurance, that kind of thing, right? The question is, well, what if people are vandalizing your stuff? What can you do to keep them from vandalizing your stuff? And, you know, fortifying, it's one thing. You obviously can't, like, trap it, you know, build traps and moats and stuff around it. You can't, you can't <laughs> make it out and out <laughs> dangerous like that. So that's a problem. But here's the other question that I get asked all the time. And people often talk about the Postal Service understanding that there is something different about it. It's a federal agency. And as a result, there are federal statutes that talk about what happens with the Postal Service and mailboxes. Now, you might have a mailbox out by the road where you live. I do, right? So there's a mailbox out by the road. I go out and get my mail from it. I own that mailbox, but the mailbox is someplace that the Postal Service places mail. As a result, it is protected by federal law. Federal law. So I actually looked this up because I want to make sure that this is very, very clear. From the United States Postal Service.com, USPS.com, mailbox vandalism isn't a joke. Now, I'm not saying that the man in the previous story vandalized a mailbox. I'm simply talking about the people who were vandalizing the mailbox before the man fortified it, okay? So the idea that kids go out with baseball bats and knock over mailboxes because they think it's funny, you should understand that technically speaking, that's a crime. And um, it's something you can get prosecuted for. I don't know how often that happens, but taking a bat to a mailbox, hitting it with a brick, may seem like fun <laughs> to some rambunctious teens. <laughs> hey, I didn't write that, okay? Somebody else did. It may seem like fun. Just so you know, there's a really bad edit right there. And I had to actually bleep out something that the U.S. Postal Service put on their website. And I understood the moment I said it that it was going to get demonetized if I put it up and left it in the video. So I, I'll put a link to this article in the description below. And it's in the first full sentence. And it's something that teens might find fun, supposedly. But you should understand it's a criminal act to harm a mailbox. Mailbox vandalism increases during the summer months. And we need to encourage everyone to be aware of any misconduct that may occur in their neighborhoods. Uh, this is from a postmaster in Milwaukee. Mailboxes are protected by federal law. Crimes against mailboxes and the mail they contain are considered federal offenses. Violators can be fined up to a quarter of a million dollars or imprisoned for up to three years for each act of vandalism. So just so you understand, <laughs> those teenagers who think it's fun to go out and vandalize a mailbox, 
theoretically are facing a quarter of a million dollars in fines and three years in a federal prison. I've never heard of that happening, but theoretically it's possible. So there you go. Mailbox vandalism isn't a joke, and I apologize for the bad edit, but what can I do? Meanwhile, back the driver paralyzed after plowing into an Ohio man's fortified mailbox who is suing the homeowner. The Ohio State Supreme Court will make a ruling on this in up to four months, and when they do, I will update the story because I'm as fascinated as you are, and I know you're fascinated. The New York Daily News uh, ran the story at NewYorkDailyNews.com. Brian Nemitz wrote it. Walter sent it. Thanks a lot. Questions or comments? Put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. This is your life, and it's ending one minute at a time.